almost think Aston Martin is the most seductive car dealer in the sense they really build true GT cars. These are sports cars, but these are really grand touring cars. They have beautiful leather. They have a great sound system. This is the kind of car, if you have a date, he or she doesn't mind riding in your Aston Martin as opposed to your sports car, which blows their hair all over the place or whatever it might be, you know? And that's what I love about them. I mean, they're extremely comfortable, yet they have all the luxury items and all the trick things, you know, the speakers come up and the, the flip things flip over. Yeah, you know, it's, it's very cool. It's a very cool car. And as you said, Aston Martin has always been about grand touring. I mean, the Aston Martins, the great cars that we know, the DB4, DB5, DB6, are two plus two cars. So they always had rear seats, unlike a Porsche or a Ferrari. Mm -hmm. And um, it's also, there's a tradition of making four-door Aston Martins that a lot of people are not aware of. Um, certainly the first ones, which is one of my favorite cars, the uh, 1961 to 1963 uh, Aston Martin Lagonda Rapide. Right, based right, Based on the right. DB4. A stunning car, I think. Um, it was a car basically created for David Brown um, as personal transport and then became a, a production car. And then the very controversial uh, William Towns designed right. Wedge Lagonda. You know, I love that car. I thought that was a fabulous looking thing. Uh, and unfortunately, it had that sort of Texas instrument dashboard, which kind of screwed it up a little bit. It was all, that was the day. Right now, it looks terribly dated right. because it's, it's like one of those bad watches where it flashes with the red, you know. <laughs> uh, but back in the, the design still holds up well. It's still a, a fascinating looking design. I think it's a stunning car. And just as an aside, Aston Martin is always noted for having each of its engines built by a single craftsman right. whose name was put on a plaque on the engine. And most of the Lagonda engines were built by Don Osborne. Oh, is that right? Yes, I, absolutely. the guy named... Something like Takeeg Marek, something like yeah, that. Tadek yeah, Tadek Marek. Tadek yes. Marek, yeah, I remember he did it. Uh, and to get back to design, I think this is probably one of the best-looking hatchbacks I've ever seen. It's a beautiful four-door design. I know that you are a big fan of the four-door GT car. Uh, sorry, the four-seater GT car. You have two Lamborghini Espadas. Right, right. Which is really the first of the uh, fast GT four-seaters. And personally, again, for me, I think that Aston Martin did a wonderful design with this car that is much more in keeping with the brand than, for instance, the Porsche Panamera. Right, which right. Which is slightly awkward looking as a four-seater. Right. But uh, one of the things that is disappointing to me and to many Aston Martin aficionados is the fact that they call this a repeat and not a Lagonda repeat. Traditionally, the four-door Astons had been Lagondas. And I know that's a, a funny thing that, that we've talked about before, the fact that everyone thinks of Lagonda as this great British brand, but actually was started... Well, no, it was started in England, but it's named for by, a river. Well, started by, Alfred, by an American. Alfred, no, but yeah, yes, it, but in England. Yes. Alfred Gunn. Uh, it's near um, Chagrin Falls, Ohio. It's the Lagonda River, and Lagonda was an Indian name. People think it's some exotic Italian name, but it's not. Uh, and what happened was Aston Martin bought Lagonda. Bentley went to work for Lagonda. He designed their V12, the first modern engine he designed, overhead cam. And then... Uh, uh, Aston Martin bought Lagonda and of course the repeat and Lagonda repeat but I think they realized marketing wise Aston Martin was a bigger name than Lagonda people are, Lagonda what, what is that you know exactly but you mentioned the engine and uh, this car has got a great six liter uh, V8 very powerful car 400 horsepower no 470 470 horsepower exactly 470, yes sorry yeah. and uh, as you said it also makes a wonderful sound let's take it out for a drive let's do see it see what let's it's like it. let's put our emotion key in yes you see this slips right in there like that there you go. that's a pretty satisfying sound yeah it is it is, it is. You know, the thing people sometimes forget about this, this is not a Porsche GT3, right. you know? It's not a harsh riding race car for the road. It is a GT car, which is a grand touring car, which means you have all the power and handling of a sports car, but with normal road clearance and just a lot of nice luxury features, the leather, the radio, etc. It's got a hatchback. You can fold down the rear seats, which make it somewhat practical. I mean, you know, it's not a station wagon, it's not right. uh, an SUV, but I think that this is the kind of car you could really live with on a daily basis, more than some of those other sports cars. This is a car that the style counts for more than long-range comfort. The two of us up front, 
we could drive across the country tomorrow. Right, right. Um, backseat passengers, I think, probably just out to lunch would probably be the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we've also got, of course, as every modern sports guy has, the options for a sport package, which is probably engage. We can engage sport. And we'll engage the active suspension. Whoa. Oh, that, that's the Aston that Martin. Yeah, yeah, that's where the Aston comes Martin in. comes alive. <laughs> All of a sudden, we're in Bond land. And the fun thing about it is, people don't realize it's a four door. They right. go, oh, 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 it's a four door. You know, it doesn't have that, oh my God, look at those two ugly doors stuck in the back right there. You know, so that's, uh, styling wise, I think it's one of the mo most clever. Uh, a four door that looks like a two door is the ideal car, isn't it? Which is interesting because there's a whole uh, trend now towards the so called four door coupe. Uh, Mercedes has them, BMW has them. Mm -hmm. They're usually crossover models. Right. That to me look slightly out of scale sometimes. Right, right. They're a little too tall and the roofs are a little too sloped. They seem to be trying too hard. Yeah. And I think this is somewhat a timeless design. I think you could come out with this right now. I mean, this car is 11 years old, yes. really, almost just about 10 years old, 11 years old. But if you came out with it today, it still is distinctive and attractive. You it know. also speaks to the brand quality. It looks like an Aston Martin. Right, right, kind of right. Aston Martin. And uh, I think that's one of the things that, that lean, that, that make a, a car potentially a classic. Uh, we don't have our crystal balls out, so we can't say that this will be uh, a classic car. But, you know, I think it's certainly a car that's going to be interesting. The electronics are what really sort of age more quickly than anything else. The right. display for the, uh, for the navigation and all that is far more sophisticated than it was back in the 1990s, but certainly not the state of the art today. But it's funny how you say that, whether it might, might or might not be a classic. Uh, like the Bentley Mulliner sedans, I have mm -hmm. an 8-liter one. And I was fortunate mine had not been chopped up into a Le Mans Tour. Right. Because even as late as the 80s and mid-90s, people were buying those nice Bentley town cars and Bentley sedans and turning them into open roadsters, trying to make a quick buck. Exactly. Consequently, now they're expensive because there aren't any left. They all got turned into roadsters. And the question will be for a car like this, uh, as it ages through middle age into used car status, is will there be enough people who appreciate the cars for what they are to continue the maintenance? As these cars become less expensive as used cars, the maintenance costs don't go down. Right, right. You know, there, there still have to be maintained as the almost two hundred thousand dollar cars they were new. Uh, yeah, these are wonderful. I, I I love I love Aston Martin as a brand. I mean, they're very smart. It, they are an extremely small company. Yes. I mean, they make more cars. Most manufacturers make most car more cars in an hour, or they maybe it, certainly in a day than they make in a year. So yeah. there is that still that hand made quality to it. I remember David Brown, when the DB5 came out, uh, a friend of his said, he wanted to buy one, and it said, he said, I'll give you a good price, and the guy said, no, I want it at your cost. <laughs> and he charged him a thousand pounds more because he lost a thousand pounds on every car he built. So he says, oh, you want it at my cost? Oh, okay, fine. You know. There's really nowhere on the island where you can make this guy do what it does, but but you can hear that 12. I mean, it's got plenty of accelerate. Yeah. It's a fantastic car. Again, that comes back to uh, the specifications of the latest models. Uh, in 2011, this is a very impressive uh, performance. Uh, zero to 60 in 5.1 seconds, you know, with 400 horsepower from the yeah. 12. Today, that's, oh, well, that's nice performance. Nothing really special to write home about. But it's about, use for me, it's about usable performance. You know, right. this is the kind of performance that you could use far more often than a thousand horsepower or something. Well, that's what happens with a lot of manufacturers. They fall just behind in the horsepower wars, you know? I mean, you've got Corvettes now and McLaren's 720, right. 750 horse. You've got Dodge Demons with 809 horsepower, all kinds of horsepower. And then someone says, how much is that? 470. Oh, oh. I don't see what. I mean, that's a <laughs> tremendous amount of horsepower. Sure. And it handles like an Aston and it's got normal road clearance. and. I mean, these are wonderful cars. I think if we can convert the world into the practical but entertaining, whether it's a brass era car 
a classic car, a 1950s car. You know, I think that there's so much in that, in the experience of driving right. a car that is practical and usable, no matter what performance it delivers, at all levels. I mean, I got to drive one of the DB9s with a manual stick, and I love that thing. The only thing I didn't like about it is they had Recaro seats in it, so ah. those butter clenching, <laughs> just sort of clutching, you're, you're sitting like, it was so uncomfortable. You can't me. take a deep I, breath in. Yes, I would rather have my ribs. nice ass in my, you want to be comfortable when you go for a drive. And this is not a car, this is a car you go across state lines with all the time. Right. You know, you're driving it for a few hours on end because it's so relaxing and so nice. And you've got room to carry your luggage for a weekend trip or even a right. week's trip. Sure. But now we can put our foot in it and go for a ride and uh, I guess we'll say goodbye to the folks and go drive up the coast, shall we Donald? <laughs>